How's it going, everybody? Welcome uh, to my 1800 square foot shop. My name's Andy Rawls, and I run a full time furniture business out of the shop. And I want to apologize for running you into my door. I'm fairly new with the drone, uh, and luckily the drone is okay. I didn't break it. Uh, so let's just jump into the shop. I want to take you through the process, take you through uh, the machines I use, and uh, hopefully you learn something. This is a very long video, the longest video I've ever posted on my channel. Uh, so I might bore some of you, uh, but hopefully, most, hopefully a lot of you will find this interesting. So let's just jump right in and get started. We start at the back of the shop where's all the, lum the lumber's at. Now, first I'll tell you, I'm not a very organized person. It's probably one of the things I least like about myself, which is a weird thing to say, but I wish, I wish I could be organized. But I thought about cleaning this place up and making it real immaculate for you guys, but I, what's the point? This is, this is my space, and it looks like it looks every day in this video. So this big bin right here has got all my drop-off, a ton of just lumber in here I can pick through and use for anything. Probably twice a year I'll go through pull it all out, throw it in the back of my truck. Not all of it, but I'll pick through what I don't use or don't think I'll use and just burn it, get rid of it, and clean it out. Keep sheet goods over here. Uh, there's no full sheet. Usually if the full sheets are back here, tucked in there, and then all the cut-ups are here. So I have an option uh, for pieces if I need a small piece of plywood for a jig or something like that. So next to the scrap pile, I've got all my basically lumber that I store. I don't have a lot right now. Um, most of this is just extra leftover from other projects. There's some mahogany up there, which is sadly carelessly stacked. Um, that's actually my dad's lumber. He has some project plan for that, and I'm just storing it. I uh, usually will bring in lumber uh, a lot of times, just delivered to the shop, and then it gets stacked in here, and then it gets turned into furniture. So that's kind of how that works. Uh, this is so cool for the Airstream or the Argosy. Big table here that just basically became a catch-all, uh, old stuff. And then I've got storage down here. Um, I keep my throwing axes right here for whenever uh, I'm having a bad day in the shop. I can go chunk these, uh, relieve a little stress. Okay, so moving back along from our lumber, we've got uh, an old junky radial arm saw that has no precision to it whatsoever. It's just for rough cutting lumber. So the first thing I do in any part of the process of building furniture is cut rough things to length, rough boards to length. And I do most of that, probably 80% of that right here on this machine. I can pull it off the racks, drop it right down. This table is a little bit lower, but I can shim it up and I can cut long boards, uh, rough them out to length. If they don't work on here, if they're too long, I'll just use a circular saw. Okay, so moving over to the back corner of the shop, we've got um, the Quincy air compressor. Uh, this had this for about two years. It's worked great, it's five horsepower. Uh, no complaints with that. A lot of this lumber is, um, my personal just kind of stash of collected lumber, these big post oak slabs came from my family's property and those slabs right there came from family property. So a lot of this lumber I've had for years and years and years and I don't know what I'll do with it. I just stash it back here. I also have a separate building with some more lumber, uh, but it's not much in there that's that exciting. Three phase converter right here. Uh, bought that off of my old boss. Uh, it runs my three phase equipment and then I've got this kind of radiator hose deal that drains water my attempt to get water out of the airlines before it gets to the machinery because i don't have a dryer on my compressor uh, basically these things fill up with water because they condense and that water gets into the line and can get in your machine so this is my attempt uh, to keep that water out of the machines okay so moving over from the water electrical hazard we have the giant uh, five horsepower Dust collector. I don't even know how much CFM this is. I totally forget. Uh, made by Oneida. A really, really, really good dust collector. I have two Oneida dust collectors. I'll show you the other one here in a bit. I'll put a link in the description to a lot of these tools because Oneida is definitely one that I support and wanted to share. They they gave me a discount on this dust collector, and I have a more of a long, a bigger review on that. It was done years ago, but it is a beast of a dust collector. I'll turn it on real quick. Pretty loud. Pretty obnoxious but it works really well I've got it hooked up uh, a signal on it which yeah you can see right there is a light so if the barrel fills up it'll it'll signal that light and I know it's full which is very helpful because you don't want to overfill this it has a nice HEPA dust filter back here uh, that filters out all the really fine dust particles especially coming from the big wide belt because we get a lot of that uh, when we're sanding obviously so I have an airline hooked up here and I got a little blower hooked up to, and I can use this to clean that HEPA filter out. If you blow this out every day, it helps with the efficiency of the machine. It keeps it going, um, keeps the suction way higher. Than, once this thing gets clogged up, 
it really slows down all that fine dust will fall down in that black bin down there and I can dump it so we move on to my most favorite machine in the shop this is uh, an Oliver 36 inch bandsaw model number 35 it was built in 1925 October of 1925 um, solid cast iron it has a three foot by three foot table which is huge uh this thing um is a complete beast of a machine i love it i bought this for 500 dollars off of a guy it was in his carport and it was hadn't been touched it was totally rusted out um in really bad shape and i completely restored it and I, that whole series is on a playlist on my channel i'll link that in the description if you want to watch it uh, we rebuilt this saw put new bearings in it cleaned it up painted it and it just runs beautifully and it, it's amazing how well it works. I put a seven and a half horsepower motor on this. This thing has got plenty of power. It's all got a VFD on it uh, so we can control the speed. We can control how fast the rotation is. Uh, and we can also use the motor to slow the thing down because these cast iron wheels are so, they have so much mass that it would literally spin forever if you weren't breaking it in some way, which, um, you know, back in the days, that's exactly what happened. But nowadays we're fortunate to have uh, technology that can control the motor and help control the machine. Well, this is one of my favorite features on the saw is you've got a tilting table um, and you have to realize that this is a and this needs some oil um, this is a heavy 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 tabletop I mean you're solid cast iron three feet by three feet and so this big wheel here will tilt that table to any angle you need and you can kind of see I put some angle to it it's got the adjustment for your guides, obviously. It's on the spring here, and I use a little parachute cord. That helps pull that up, because that assembly is heavy. This is your tensioning to tension your blade. And this is a really cool custom engraved plaque I had done by a good friend named Weldon Lister, who's an amazing, amazing, amazing craftsman. We put the or origination date and the remodel date, although now it kind of looks like my born and died date, but that's okay. It's still really cool. Thanks Weldon for making that. This plate was the original plate that was on it. Ed Friedrich Incorporated. Ed Friedrich uh, started a company and he was building furniture in the early 1900s and morphed into refrigeration and that company still exists today. The big belt system back here. So we've got a giant flat pulley to a paper pulley that I had made onto the motor and the flat belt that runs it. You might notice that little burn there. I uh, locked up the saw and it just burned out on that paper pulley. It was pretty pretty intense, pretty scary. Original greasing plate here. Don't have a lot of light down here, but it tells you what, um, what to grease everything with. Didn't want to change any of that. Didn't want to uh, restore or repaint that. I kept that original. So this machine is one of my favorite machines, um, obviously because of the history and how much work I put into it. And it is actually a very useful machine. I use it in building furniture a lot. So I'm um, very thankful to have this one in the shop. Okay, moving from vintage machinery uh, to modern day technology in the saw stop. Most of you probably already know what a saw stop is. If you don't, this table saw cannot, well, it, it won't cut you because it has a sensor in it. And if you, if you touch this blade while it's spinning, it actually triggers a break and shoots the blade down below the table surface. Um, and it works. Uh, not that I've put my finger in it, but I've set the brake off. There's ways you can set it off. You cut green lumber or something metal, it'll set that off. And I've done it probably five or six times. There's a few small gripes about this machine. I mean, I've got the cross cut slider on here. Works pretty good. Uh, over time, it's starting to develop this tilt like that, which I have not been able to adjust out. It has a positive stop at 90 and 45, neither of which are accurate. Um, when you put it at 90, you have to get a square out and do test cuts and get it to 90. Um, which, you know, is a little, little bit of a gripe for what you pay for this, but uh, it's still, all in all, it's pretty well made, pretty nice product. Uh, so it's a good machine. Let's move on to the SCMI sander. My saw horses, just so you know, the first video I ever made on YouTube were these two saw horses, which are full, they're caked in finish. Uh, these are inspired by Paul Sellers. Um, he has a ton of the stuff I do is inspired by Paul. He's pretty awesome. So. If you want to see me with these very first video, Matt Carricker actually filmed it and helped edit it. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. A lot's changed since then. Um, 43 inch wide, wide belt sander, single head, which means I have one uh, abrasive in there. You can get two and three heads, which you can get multiple abrasives. It's a single head. I paid roughly right around 10 grand for this machine. 
Um, I bought it on X, Fa X Factory, which is a broker and broker's machines out of um, old shops. I probably overpaid for it, um, especially when it showed up. It had a lot of issues that I had to fix myself. This had to be replaced. A lot of the sensors in there had to be replaced. So um, of all the machines I bought, this financially um, was the hardest one to buy. It saved, it, it's paid for itself since then because it's just a workhorse. It takes out a lot of labor and sanding and flattening tabletops. Uh, but when I first bought it, I was super stressed because I felt as if I had overpaid, and I think I probably did. So let's take a look inside, and I'll show you the meat and bones of it. All right, so that's the single head. So if you had a double or three head machine, you would have two of these or three of these. Uh, and each one would have a different grid abrasive. The advantage to that, obviously, is you don't have to come through and change the abrasive every time. I usually start, if I'm flattening a tabletop, I'll start with a 60 grit, go to an 80 grit, 120 220 or 150 um, basically this pull this out you release the pressure the paper slides in and out I stored my paper up here on this rack uh, and that's you know that's basically the gist of the machine it has a platen on it which helps flatten uh, it's great machines worked well it's pretty pretty solid pretty solid machine it does not come with the beautiful children's art uh, this is my kids section of the shop right here uh, they basically hijack any blackboard I put up to take notes on becomes their art space. Okay, so from the wide belt, we have the S4S. I call it an S4S. You call it a molder. This machine can do a lot of stuff, but I use it specifically to S4S, which stands for surface four sides. Basically, you can send a rough board through this machine, and it'll pop it out mill to dimensions. So it's got four cutter heads in it, uh, one on the bottom, one on the side, one on the opposite side, and then a planer which cuts the top. This machine I, I bought used from a guy somewhere out in middle of Texas for 4500 bucks, And uh, it's, again, um, an expensive machine to buy, but it's paid for itself for sure. In a one-man shop, milling lumber can take a lot of time. And so basically this will replace if, let's just pretend I had to mill a board if you don't know anything about that process. First you have to flatten the face and then get that face uh, jointed square uh, to the edge so you have two milled faces hopefully that makes sense you would use a joiner to do that then you would go to another machine called the table saw which we just saw and rip it to the width you want then you would go to another machine which is a planer and plane it to thickness so you would have to use three machines and change settings constantly it's a long process where with this you can rip your board maybe a quarter inch bigger than you need the finished width and then feed it through this machine and it's done so it not I would say more than cuts your milling time in half uh, so it definitely is a money maker it pays for itself from a business standpoint I would not get rid of this machine uh, at all this is a very important machine in the shop that I do use uh, quite often to mill lumber the issue with this machine is it does have a leaky gearbox all these it has all these gearboxes back in here and man they all the all the gaskets are bad I'm not brave enough to take it all apart and fix it I just keep pumping oil into it. You can see I have a bucket down there uh, full of gear oil. Probably once every couple months I'll reload it all up. Uh, and one of these days I'm going to have to get in there and change the gaskets. But it's not really something I'm excited about. Okay, so we move on to my joiner planer combo machine. This is the Jet. This was the first big piece of equipment I bought when I started my business. About 10 years ago when I was my wife and I had, we didn't have kids yet. I was just starting my business. I was in a transition period from moving from my job to, to going full-time as a furniture maker, and this is the first machine I bought. It's been a really good machine. I think I paid $2,500 for it, and I added a helical head to it. I, this, I bought the straight enough machine and decided to add a helical, helical head. Um, only, the only downside is I've worn it out. I mean, it is. I, I need to replace this machine uh, probably this year. It, the chain drive breaks on it constantly. I'm constantly working on it. So, Jet makes good equipment for the hobbyists, uh, for the weekend warrior, but if you're a professional and you're running it constantly, you will wear these machines out super fast. And this one, uh, it needs to be replaced. And I, I have several machines in mind, but I'm just waiting on the right moment. My saw blades all lined up over here, uh, safety equipment. Crosscut sled, which I don't use anymore. I, I can take this down and get rid of it because I have the. Uh, sled attachment on the saw stop and then my uh, super awesome dustpan that I hand carved out of a single board 
I'll put a link into that video in the description. Lamps all along up here. A lot of them are on the floor behind me because I'm gluing up the tabletop. More clamps here. I will say, uh, these jet clamps, I'm sorry jet, but I do not like them. Oh, I would, I don't like them. The Bessie's pretty dang good. These are really good. These are my favorite ones here. These are Bessie's as well. These are a little older model, um, a little worn out, but these jets, I mean, the, the screw on them is just, looks like, I don't even know what that is, but it's not a, it's not a very good thread and they just, they're really hard to tighten down. They drive me crazy. All right, next machine, the Grizzly. We're a little tilted. Let me see if I can fix that. There we go. This is the Grizzly Ultimate 14 inch bandsaw. This is actually a really good machine that I have, again, just like the Jet, worn out and beat up pretty bad. Uh, and I wouldn't say it's in great shape. So it's nice to have a 14 inch bandsaw in the shop uh, for doing a small, quick jobs. I keep it close to the workbench. Um, and then I need to do heavy resaw work. The Oliver is the machine of choice. Um, but for the most part, this is a decent machine. And uh, before I had the Oliver, I used I used the heck out of this, and I really beat this up. So eventually, I would like to replace it with something maybe a little bit bigger, uh, maybe an 18 inch. But for now, it's getting the job done. Okay, let's jump over here real quick. Um, storage, all my finishing material I keep in here. This is not. I don't think this is a fireproof, uh, although it is heavy duty. Um, I keep all my finishing and grease and paints and junk in here uh all the abrasives for my sander i have a whole bunch i'm stocked up those are sitting up here the liberty safe this is a cool addition i put into the shop liberty actually sent me this which is awesome i'll put a link to them in the description below. they're not sponsoring this video but i love this safe um, i keep a lot of the tools that i've worked on that you don't want your kids playing with i probably just got my coat i keep in this safe um if you haven't seen these videos, these are pretty cool. I'll link these in the description. This is Osage. Uh, and you can see, if you watch that video, you can see how nicely this wood is patinaed. It's not uh, orange like it normally would when you first uh, start it. This is my papa's old 16, 16 gauge. Uh, so the great thing about having the safe in the shop is I do work on the um, stocks. And uh, a lot of times clients will send me things to build display cases for. So not long ago I did a display case uh, for some old Navy, not old Navy swords, but some Captain Navy swords. So anytime a client's going to send me something of value to them, I have a safe and secure place to keep it. All right, let's talk about the CNC. Now, this is an X-Carve. A lot of y'all know that. I have worked with X-Carve for a couple years. I will say, uh, and I speak truthfully, this is actually a very useful little machine. I use it a lot in my shop uh, to make jigs mostly for furniture. Um, and I've, you know, it's not perfect. There's nothing perfect about this machine, uh, but it, for what you're paying, for what you're getting, it does an amazing job. And it has the software built into it, so it's really easy to use. If you're new to CNC, this is a great starting point. I would love one day to update this and get a big, uh, bigger machine, a more, more um, sturdy machine. But for now, this is really doing the job. I keep all my tooling in here. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Texas beers, but real ale beer is good stuff. I got a mini fridge, which, let's see what's in there. I, you know what, you can't even open it. I don't think I've opened this in probably, oh wait, I think there's a cold beer in here. Oh dang, it's empty. Shucks, that was about to be a good surprise. Yeah, that's always unfortunate when your fridge is empty. Chalkboard I never used. This was a cool calendar I made and I stopped using it. The way I work with my furniture is I have these order sheets. They go on clipboards. This is a golf ball display case I just finished and sent to Denver, Texas. So I have all the info laid out here, the due dates. I write the completion date on it and then the cut list and I file this away when I'm done with it. And when I need to build another one or in 20, 30 years when I'm going through all the work I've done, I have it all documented. I think it's important to do that. Okay, so this is my uh, Oliver lathe. This is the newest machine in the shop. I, I got this not long ago. Uh, this is a newer, all of our machinery is still in business. They're a little different than what they were when they were building the old machines, but still making high quality machines. And this is a really, really nice lathe. I've got this extension on it so I can turn big giant bowls. And I had this amazing idea that I was going to start turning bowls. And then I started playing around with it and I realized how hard it was. And I kind of fizzled out a little bit. I need to get refocused. Um, I actually would love to take a bowl turning class or something to try to figure it out and get a little better at it. Uh, but one day I'll start tackling bowls. I still need to get a good chuck for turning bowls. I don't have anything 
for that right now. I've got all my uh, turning tools here, and then I've got an adjustable rack here that I made that you could pivot and swivel. Um, this is actually a copy. I worked with Brian Boggs for a while in Kentucky, and he had a system for turning spindles on his lathe, and he used this exact same setup so he could switch between tools real quick, so I just copied that. I built that probably died a long time ago, like 15 years ago. Yeah, so I'm hoping uh, in the future I can get into some bull turning. Uh, I just need to kind of force myself to do it. I keep electronics and books in a very unorganized fashion in this cabinet. Anything I don't want dust on goes in here. This is a really important part of the shop, my dehumidifier. I actually run this a lot because it helps. It doesn't, obviously this is, a, this is a pretty big unit, but it's not going to dehumidify this giant shop, but it does bring it down some. It does help. Uh, so I run that a lot. And it's got a hose that runs out right out the back of the building and drains. This is my Yates 14-inch uh, sander. I love this machine, although I've recently been having issues with it. It's got a ton of vibration in it. Um, let's see, it's a shoddy wiring job back there. It, I, I, I don't rem When I bought it, I remembered it being smoother, although there's part of me that thinks maybe I bought it that way. But uh, this um, whole, I don't know what you call this, the head or the spindle or whatever, is it's got to be out of balance not a true because I put new bearings on it and um, I've done a lot of work on it to try to get the vibration out and I've failed miserably we're gonna listen to that wind down for a long time and it's gonna squeak it's gonna take a while the next thing is my sand right sander which I don't use a lot this is a pump-up sander so you can put air in this bladder and you can kind of conform to shapes um, it's actually a really really cool sander and super helpful uh, I just I don't know why I don't use it a lot. I actually thought about several times selling it. My stereo system is from Turtle Box. These guys are awesome. I know the guys who have this company. They're out of Houston. And uh, these things are dust proof, waterproof. There's two of them. They pair up into a stereo. Uh, the other one's sitting right over there. Um, highly recommendable. I can take them out. They're Bluetooth. I can take them outside when I'm working on things outside and listen to music outside as well. Okay, next machine. Hopefully I'm not boring you guys with this. Uh, if you're a woodworker, you're probably enjoying it. This is my mortiser. Here comes the squeaking. Uh, this is also an Oliver machine. I bought this off eBay. Um, I paid a lot for it. I won't tell you how much I paid. I totally restored it, repainted it, took it all apart, cleaned it up, put new bearings in it, and uh, it really, really works well. Now, out of all my machines, this is the most difficult machine to learn and figure out. It has it has a very high RPM motor on it. It's 3,500 RPMs. It's direct drive. The only way you can adjust the speed on this is with the VFD, and I thought about doing that, but it, it, it's such a fast spin rate that it heats up the tooling really easily. So if you don't have your tooling dialed in, I'm going to stop this annoying me. If you don't have your tooling dialed in and set up properly, you're going to heat it up really quickly. Uh, it's a very important with these to tune your chisels up, to get them nice and sharp and your auger bits. If you can do all that, this machine uh, really performs quite nicely and cuts really nice mortises. So you got a pedal here that is going to drop the chisel down into the workpiece. You can move your table side to side. You can move the table front to back here. You can move the whole table up to down, up and down. You can do 45 angles, any angle you want. Uh, so that you can do a lot with this machine. It's got a stop here, so when you plunge it, uh, you can set your depth of cut and it'll hit right there like that. You got to be very careful when you use this machine because you can actually put so much leverage on it that you can move that stop down. And I've actually done that to the point I wasn't paying any attention and I ch I ran my chisel right into the table, which you can't see, but it was a really sad moment. Uh, and I learned my lesson. So now when I'm using the machine, my I'm not looking here at my workpiece when I'm using it. I'm looking right here and I'm making sure that when I hit that, I'm not putting any more pressure on that because you can push that down with the pedal. Up here, let's move on to this. This is my basketball goal, which I love to play. I shoot hoops in here all the time. Spurs flag, because I'm a huge Spurs fan. Um, very sad that the season is going to end like it did, but also I think it's a free pass for the Spurs because then we're going to make the playoffs probably, and now it doesn't really matter. I have a surfboard, and probably people wonder why. I'm not a surfer. I'm probably a poser for putting that up there. I have surfed some in Costa Rica, but a buddy of mine who moved to Hawaii gave me that. He didn't want to take it with him. Um, and we kind of had this deal where I was going to shape a board out of wood for him using that and I haven't gotten around to it but one day uh, I will do that. Sean, be on the lookout. You're going to get your wooden surfboard. 
I'm not a climber for a while. I did some bouldering. Uh, I like to work out on that and just do pull-ups. Okay, moving on. We're getting into the hand tool section of the shop. This is what I call the bench area. This is my favorite part of the shop. Uh, my little drill press is right here. Nothing fancy about it. Um, just an everyday drill press. Not much to say to that. I've got a blackboard here where I try to keep notes of my day, keep myself organized and what I need to get accomplished. Um, clamps up here. This table is basically a catch-all of junk and it stays that way. I can never keep it clean. I've got an 8 inch slow speed grinder for sharpening chisels and, and any kind of steel I need to sharpen. And then I keep obviously just storage in here. I've got a lot of power tools thrown in here. Um, I've got router bits and all kinds of stuff. Tools and everything I need uh, stuck in this. So this is the area of the shop that I'm kind of embarrassed of because it's so messy and or unorganized. Um, but oh well. Okay, so moving on to, there's actually a blender on this bent workbench. No, I'm not making margaritas. I'm, that was actually an experimental video that didn't, didn't go well. Um, I tried to make paper, by the way. I tried to do a, a YouTube video where I was going to make paper, um, basically, because there's no toilet paper. And I couldn't figure out how to do it. So, it was, it was a failure, to say the least. Okay, so my bench here, this is... I built this bench a while back for my dad, and then when he moved here, I kind of stole it and put it in the shop. Uh, I've got all my hand saws back here. Everything I need for any hand saw work is on this uh, saw till. If you want plans for this, I do sell these plans. I'll put a link in my description. i um, also got coping saws. Over here is, let me bring you guys over. Okay, so this is basically a cabinet to store any kind of nail screws, just all kinds of hardware and stuff. This is actually designed by Roy Underhill. I think there's, if you search his Roy Under, Underhill nail cabinet, you'll find this. You'll find plans for it. Uh, it's a really nice little, fun little project to build, and it works really well. Uh, it's supposed to have a door, which I never built, and then obviously it's supposed to have pulls, which I ended up using screws. Um, oh, it works. Down here, this is super cool. So, um, this is a World War II uh, tool chest that I found. Um, I keep an assortment of tools in here. It still has the old list of all the tools that were in it, the contents. It's amazing me how much they could fit in there. I keep all kinds of stuff in here, mostly the dividers. This is a really cool tool right here. Um, I use quite often some rafts and files. And then below there are tools that I never use that I just store. This is basically the hand tool wall. This is where all my favorite stuff is. All my hand planes and chisels all along here. By far my favorite hand plane. I have two favorite hand planes. Uh, this is the first hand plane I ever owned. It's a Stanley 4.5. I probably bought this around 2003, 2004 off eBay. Paid probably 60 bucks for this. And I use this plane all the time. This is my go-to plane. Um, second, probably second favorite. Oh uh, man, it's so hard to choose. I use this little Lee Nielsen, although it's pretty beat up, this little Lee Nielsen block plane, which is also a rabbit plane, so the blade goes all the way to the edge. I use this one a lot. Um, also, you got you really got to have a low angle plane for tricky grain. It's got an adjustable throat. Uh, this is also a great plane to reach for. And then probably one of the coolest stories behind the planes I have is this is a number eight Stanley that I got from Weldon Lister. I t mentioned him earlier. He's the guy who did the engraving. Um, for my bandsaw and his, I think his granddad owned this and his dad was Big Bill who, uh, if you don't know, wrote Tear in My Beer and used to play with Hank Williams back in the day. So a little bit of story behind this. I think it's kind of cool. Uh, I call it Big Bill, rightfully so. She's heavy for sure. I got all my chisels down here. Um, I keep some of my stuff I've made. This is a cool slingshot. Got a video of that. I'll link that one as well. Another Texas Heritage product. This cool little thing kind of stores uh, various tools that I want to get to fast. I use a lot of these tools uh, on a daily basis. A little square. I always reach for that. Um, marking gauge. Um, what do you call this? Oh, calipers. Yeah. Brain. Uh, most of this is glues over here. I've got some water for sharpening sitting here. Uh, super glue for quick fixes and then all my wood glues uh, some wax so you know obviously you want wax nearby okay so up here this is kind of cool and special to me this is uh, basically every piece of furniture that I've built in this shop since I've been working here I've written it down the date the client you know a special note about it 
Uh, and my hope is that over the course of 30 or 40 years that uh, I can fill all this up uh, with these people's names and dates and all these projects I've been fortunate enough to build. I think it'd be really cool to be able to do that. And um, God willing, I hope I can do that. Down here on the floor, I have a couple um, toolboxes that I made quite, this one, I made this one in 2006. And this one's probably a couple years later. These are both Paul Sellers design again. Um, they uh, hold a lot of my tools and they're a little dirty. I need to clean them out. These, this one was entirely made with hand tools. Um, all the dovetails, you know, they have dovetail corners, which are kind of hard to see because it's so dusty. Uh, so I'm pretty proud of this. You know, this was something I made not long after taking classes with Paul uh, in Waco, Texas. Various stuff down here. I've got a mortising jig, uh, spoke shaves. Uh, this is also a home, uh, Paul Sellers project I did a long time ago. A little pine box. So as you can tell, I have two workbenches. Both of them are the same. Again, they are Paul Sellers design. I built this one. This is the first big project I ever built out of framing lumber. Um, and so I've mentioned Paul Sellers a lot. Uh, I, I think it was around 2004. I took. I was going to school at Baylor in Waco, Texas, and I took classes at Homestead Heritage uh, as kind of a. My dad did it as a graduation gift. We both went out there. I was. We were building furniture together at this point, but I had no idea what. Uh, real furniture was how it was built so my dad got us this class to go out there and work with Paul Sellers and that's really you know I can I can probably contribute that m moment to the reason why all this happened uh, I really just was taken back by how awesome Paul was and how cool the whole process of building furniture was uh, by hand and, and understanding joinery and all that cool stuff so um, I want to say that just because um, I'm grateful to Paul Sellers, and if you're looking to learn about woodworking, the best YouTube channel on YouTube is Paul Sellers' channel for that. Uh, I would go subscribe to it right now. Uh, he is, uh, if you want to learn uh, traditional woodworking, he's the guy to learn from. So, this bench has served me very well for many years. I am uh, really wanting to get an updated workbench. Frank Straza, who also uh, taught at Homestead, Homestead Heritage, and I've uh, recently did a habit made video profiling his work which you can see I'll put a link in the description of that one as well he built amazing workbenches and he's not far from here and we've both talked back and forth about doing a workbench and I would love to have uh, one of his workbenches uh, a similar style to his it's got amazing work holding capabilities and just a beautiful uh, workbench so one of these days I'm gonna build one of those and if you're interested in seeing how like what that looks like I'll link the description to his video in my I'll link the description. I'll link the video in my description to his uh, work so you can see the workbench. Eventually, eventually I will build one of those workbenches. Let me show you some of the projects I got going on. Okay, so this is the current piece I'm working on right now. Tomorrow morning on Monday when I wake up, I'll come in and be working on this table. I am filming it, so you're going to get to see this build. Uh, this is kind of a Nakashima style table, so I can't take credit for the design. It is my own um, take on it. I didn't copy anything or take any measurements for anything. I, uh, I, I scaled it up and drew it myself uh, the way I wanted to do it, but the lines and everything come from Nakashima. Uh, here's the top. Very cool. This is some beautiful Texas walnut, so it's locally sourced. It's not been steamed. It's got some beautiful color to it. You've got two book, book match boards on each end and down the middle, uh, just its own independent board. Very pretty piece. It's probably really honestly in one of my more favorite pieces I've built in a while just because the challenge of the joinery. Um, just a fun piece to figure out and build. This is going to Fredericksburg, Texas. This one here, which is completed, has been paid for. Um, it's going to Houston, Texas. We're still waiting on the client to get it. Uh, it's a real cool kind of, I don't know if you call it arts and crafts, but it's got these legs that taper thin to the top and thicker to the bottom. It's got bent lamb right there, bent lambs on each end. And then that center stretcher has a nice arch to it as well. Um, just pretty cool little design, I think. I like the look of this table. This is actually going to be used as a desk. In the off in this guy's office so okay so that kind of closes it down i hope i covered everything i hope you enjoyed the walkthrough of this um space that i'm very blessed to have and i love working in um i've worked really hard to get this and uh a couple things i want to say before we go first probably three years ago right when i started youtube uh, I took out a loan from the bank for twenty five thousand dollars it's right when my business was kind of this pivoting point where um it was growing a little bit and I just needed to get the equipment and that's how I managed to get the sander, the S4S, the table saw, the dust collector. 
all these big pieces of machinery that I have. I borrowed money for them. And thanks to YouTube, and thanks to you guys, uh, on a five-year note, I managed to pay it off in two years, two and a half years. Uh, I probably dumped 75% of my earnings I got on YouTube towards that loan and cleared it out. And I, I don't say that to be braggy in any way. I say that to say thank you to you guys for watching this channel, for helping it grow to where it's grown. I hope you've enjoyed it along the way. I hope you've learned something. I have, um, um, the blessing to me is huge. The fact that I own all this equipment now. It's all mine. Um, uh, it's a huge relief. I don't have to worry about big monthly payments anymore. So uh, big thanks to you guys uh, for tuning in. I've got a lot of exciting things happening. Obviously, we've got the Argosy restoration going on. A new video is coming on that real soon. We've got some cool furniture projects and a lot in store for 2020. Um, and speaking of 2020, it is uh, pretty crazy times right now, as we all know. So my thoughts and prayers go out to everybody, especially um, Italy and Europe and China and places that are getting really hit hard by this virus. Um, it's just wild. I cannot believe we're at this point. Uh, America's kind of on lockdown right now. Everyone's trying to stay home, which is what my family's doing. So I just want to, um, I just want to say, yeah, I'm thinking about those who are, are really getting affected by this and I'm hoping that it doesn't get to that level. Uh, hoping that we start to kind of see it level out and maybe, um, things go back to normal in the next couple months, but who knows what's going to happen. It's really a lot of uncertainty. With that being said, I am hanging around this property. We're not doing a lot as a family. I'll be working in here. Um, so please shoot me comments. Let me know if you have questions about what you've seen in here. I'm going to be uh, making an effort on this video to respond to those comments, to talk to you guys, uh, to answer your questions. Uh, so don't hesitate to shoot a comment if you see anything. Hey, that is the shop dog mayor. Um, He's kind of the, the boss of this property, and he's an awesome dog. So uh, before, we, before we leave, I want to introduce you to him. Mayor, come here, bud. You're a good dog. He is a Chow Lab mix. We got him at the pound several years ago, before any of our kids were born. And he's been an amazing dog. So like I was saying, please shoot comments, ask questions. I'll try to answer everything I can. Uh, and um, hopefully you enjoyed the video. We'll see you next time.